so Arctic on the edge. Uh, it's been a while since Aina has done one of these uh, forums and things. I mean, we have our speaker series that we do on a monthly basis, and but this is bringing cross-disciplinary uh, researchers together, and so uh, we're excited to have everyone here. Uh, to start our day, so please give a warm welcome to Dr. Marcello Tonelli, uh, who will provide remarks on behalf of the Vice President of Research. Dr. Tonelli is an Associate Vice President of Research and also a professor at the Cummings School of Med Medicine. So. Good morning. Um, thanks very much for the invitation to be here. As you've just heard, I'm, I'm uh, representing the Vice President of Research today. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this event. I think the interestingly chosen title, for me, it really calls attention to the urgency of the changes that we are facing here in the North. Not just the scientists and researchers that are working in the area, but to all of us in the general public. I mean, my perspective has been, all you have to do is open a newspaper and you can see the links between the Arctic, climate change, food security, and of course the health and well-being of Indigenous peoples. These links, they've never been more apparent. And one of the nice things about being asked to speak at an event like this is it gets me out of the medical school, away from my usual discipline, kidneys, dialysis, health services research, and see people doing really interesting stuff um, around the world. And I think that's one of the great privileges I have as a vice president of research um, in, the, in this role. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. The event that we, we are here today, in my opinion, it demonstrates a really strong commitment by the Institute uh, to take on these challenges, and I think that has potential benefits for all of us. And so I really appreciate the commitment and your dedication to sharing this work in an event like this. Just a little uh, note, some learnings for me about the Arctic Institute. It's, it really does seem like a really unique organization, and on, on behalf of the VPR, we're really proud to have it as part of the University of Calgary family. One of the key focuses under Dr. McCauley's leadership has been to ensure that the, the knowledge that we as scholars create is used for, for the common good, that it's used to promote social justice, improve quality of life, and helps us all to secure a prosperous and sustainable future. And I think for myself as a proud Canadian, I'm always delighted when Canadian institutions help Canada to play a leadership role in these important areas, just like Aina has done for nearly 75 years. From what I've learned, my reading to prepare for this event, your long history of advancing study in this area, it's really helped us to understand the unique physical, environmental, and social conditions in the North. And a lot of your impact has been on scholars and other researchers from other countries, other institutions, but you've also had a really notable impact on people from the broader population, and I think that is just so important. Looking at what AIN has achieved, you have researchers and scholars that have gotten international recognition because of their experience and achievements. And your expertise is widely sought. Leaders from industry, academia, government, other branches of the public service, they're all looking for the expertise and insights that you have. By way of example, in April of this year, Dr. Maribeth Murray, your executive director, appeared as a witness, as many of you know, to some special Senate committee meetings on the Arctic. Dr. Murray, in this, at these committee meetings, discussed the significant changes that the Arctic is experiencing, and she spent some time to describe the impact that these changes are having on the original inhabitants of the Arctic, as well as for the general Canadian public. Again, she took this opportunity, I think, and did it very well to demonstrate Canada's, how Canada's leading in this important area. In my opinion, society really benefits when we as scholars, when we focus our efforts in areas where we have strength, and where we engage with the affected people, whether those are communities, individuals, or organizations, and work with them to find solutions. Again, it seems to me that Aina does this very, very well. You successfully engage communities through your research and through targeted outreach activities that reach organizations, indigenous communities, governments, NGOs, and groups of school, group, school children, which I think is especially notable. I've had a quick look around at some of the projects, some of the projects I've seen from your reports. Um, it looks to me like they really exemplify a, a, a spirit of outreach that I'd like to see in other faculties, other disciplines, where you're, and the importance of building these relationships, which take time to nurture, and they're time consuming, but they're essential for doing work, and I think we can learn a lot from what you've done in the medical school, because we need to do more of these sorts of things. One thing to note, it was striking to me that in the special sessions at the Senate, there were multiple speakers, not just Professor Murray. And several of these speakers mentioned Aina 
which I think is a testament to the work that you're doing and the relationships that you're building. Now, of course, you also have a unique geographical advantage. You have the wonderful Kwani Lake campus. Um, it's, I, it's always a trick when you get these uh, weirdly spelled words. I, I hope that I'm saying Kwani correctly. Um, from what I see, it's got some, uh, uh, it's a real gem of our campuses. It's got a beautiful physical setting and the lists of scholarly activity that you produce are, are certainly very impressive. Again, from the university's perspective, this is a great opportunity. Um, this summer, as many of you know, the researchers at Kluani hosted a group of intrepid high school students from Robert Thirsk High School. These students had an amazing experience. They got to learn firsthand from researchers about the indigenous history, the geology, and the biodiversity of the area. And I have, I have two uh, high school aged uh, children myself, and I can say they would have been delighted to participate in this. What a great experience. I think from the university's perspective, this is exactly where we want to be. We want to offer amazing opportunities like this that shape people's lives and influence their worldview and values so they can go out and be engaged citizens and participate in these conversations that are so important about how the Arctic affects all of, all of our futures. Together, all the people in this room, you have tremendous capacity, you have tremendous expertise, and we thank you on behalf of the VPR for gathering today to, learn your to share your research with us and learn from each other. And finally, one thank you for exemplifying the outstanding collaboration of which Canadian scholars generally and University of Calgary scholars particularly are capable. I wish you all the best with your symposium today. Thank you very, very much for the invitation. So thank you, Dr. Tonelli. I know you have another event to <laughs> dash off to, so, um, but we appreciate you coming and opening up our event here. So next we have uh, our keynote speaker is Dr. Mary Beth Murray. Uh, she's been with the Arctic Institute of North America since 2013 and is currently in her second term as our executive director. Um, just a little history about the Arctic Institute. <laughs> Um, so, the Arctic Institute was established in, by an act of parliament in 1945 as a research and educational organization. Our mandate is to advance the study of the North American and circumpolar Arctic through the natural and social sciences, the arts and humanities, and to acquire, preserve, and disseminate information on physical, environmental, and social conditions in the North. It was originally established at McGill University, and in 1976, um, we moved here to the University of Calgary. And so with that, um, and I guess <laughs> I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Beth, um, so Dr. Murray, and she's gonna be speaking on Arctic change and impact and what we can do, and it's so timely, uh, given all the uh, the UN visiting, or not visiting, but all the climate change and strikes and things like that that have been occurring over the past two weeks. So welcome, Dr. Murray. Thanks, Melanie. And I just would like to acknowledge Melanie because honestly, without Melanie, we would have no institute. She really keeps us um, on the straight and narrow and running, and she has um, really been responsible for putting this day together. <laughs> Are we good? Okay. So we can go to the beginning. It's showing something funny. I'm not starting with the cryosphere, but I'm going to get to it. No. Right. We go back like this. Sorry, technical issues always. Are we, we good? Go. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start by saying this is a lot. There's going to be a lot in this. I'm probably going to go longer than the time Melanie gave me. If you can't handle it anymore, just let me know and I'll get going. Um, I want to start by um, kind of setting the stage and thinking about the history of, of Arctic research. So this month, and, our, and John Yackel is going to talk about this later on today, scientists from 19 countries, including Canada and including from the University of Calgary, are setting off on the German vessel, the Polar Stern. The Polar Stern is a scientific research vessel um, uh, from the Alfred Wegener Institute. 
and they're going to drift with the Arctic pack ice and conduct a vast array of scientific projects that are designed with the express goal of collecting the observations that we need to improve our understanding of the Arctic as a system and the uh, influence of that system on the global climate system. This project mosaic follows 22 years on from a similar project called Sheba, which involved free freezing the Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker uh, de Grossier into the Arctic pack ice in the fall of 1997. The Sheba project was similar to Mosaic. It was a year-long international effort to collect and analyze data to better understand the surface heat budget of the Arctic sea ice. How's the heat moving back and forth between the sea ice and the atmosphere and the ocean? So in 1998, so the, the Sheba project started in the fall of 98 and ran through the fall of 1997. In 1998, we already knew from satellite observations that there was a decrease in Arctic sea ice extent of nearly 3% per decade from the 1970s. There was also a well-recorded upward trend in surface temperatures and growing evidence that atmospheric circulation was changing over the central Arctic. That same year, James Morrison from the Applied Physics Laboratory at the University of Washington and Eddie Carmack from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada reported on data from Sheba that indicated that the Arctic Ocean had undergone significant changes since 1990, so just in eight years, including the fact that the warm layer in the ocean was getting warmer and it was getting closer to the surface, so closer to the perennial pack ice. Um, and the perennial pack ice is ice that is more than one year old and generally, in the past, didn't used to melt in the summertime. In uh, that same year, Morrison and a number of his colleagues published this paper in the Geophysical Research Letters, um, Is the Perennial Sea Ice Disappearing? And in that paper, they noted that uh, sea ice was continuing to decline and that sea ice was also getting thicker. And Morrison and his colleagues suggested that if this pattern were to continue over the long term, it would lead to a completely different sea ice regime in the Arctic and have potentially significant consequences for the global climate system. Over 200 scientists participated in Sheba, and that work has served the foundation for much of the work that has come in the subsequent 10, 20 plus years, and not just with respect to the Arctic Ocean, but the Arctic as a whole. So in 1990, I was finishing my undergraduate degree in archaeology, and I was, uh, like most Canadians, pretty unaware of the Arctic. I mean, I knew it was there, I knew people lived there, I knew it was cold, but I really didn't know that much about it. I remember that when I was in high school, I had a cousin who did a school exchange program with the community of Arbiad. And to me, that was just like completely unfathomable that somebody from Mississauga was going to go to Arbiad and live there for a month. By the time 1998 rolled around, I was um, finishing a PhD. And in part, some of the work that I did in my PhD was looking at Arctic marine uh, system change. Very small part of that. Now I have to remind myself what I was going to say next here. Um, so, um, Part of the work that I did involved working and living in the community of Aglulik. And over the course of my PhD, I got to know people in that community. In subsequent years, I moved to the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, and I worked in communities in Alaska. And my research shifted more and more over time to trying to understand what was happening in the Arctic from a broad perspective, not just with respect to human communities, but with respect to sea ice and the tundra and everything. Over the years, I've had the very great privilege of living not only in Alaska, but also in uh, Sweden. I have visited every Arctic country with the exception of Russia, and it's on my list. I have traveled across Nunavut in the Northwest Territories. I'm proud to be supporting our research station in Yukon. And I've come to understand that the issues that we face in the North are not just Northern issues, but they're Canadian issues and they're global issues. And I want to talk about those today. Um, so, First, I want to just remind people what the Arctic actually is. It's the people. This map shows us the distribution of, of um, indigenous, indigenous groups around the Pan-Arctic, from Greenland to Alaska to the Russian Arctic to the Sami people in, uh, in uh, Arctic Scandinavia. It's a huge number of people with diverse languages, cultures, traditions, and a 
vast wealth of knowledge and information about their, their environments. Um, I think the other thing that's important to think about when we think about the Arctic and the people who live there is how that population is distributed. So over on the left, we can see that the population is uh, greater in the European Arctic and in the Russian Arctic than it is in the North American Arctic. It's greater in Alaska than it is in Canada. It's sparsely distributed in our country and concentrated in small communities. And this presents a number of challenges, whether they're challenges around infrastructure and energy or education or even just basic communication. Um, I think it's also worthwhile to talk a little bit about the cryosphere because the cryosphere is really the thing that defines the Arctic in terms of a physical and biological place on Earth. Um, the cryosphere consists of frozen things, so land ice like permafrost, snow, river ice, this is the Yukon River in Whitehorse, glaciers, and um, sea ice. And the sea, all of these elements of the cryosphere are important not just to how the Arctic functions out of the system, but also to our global system. Um, the cryosphere is, is a huge part of the planet. In fact, if this, this map here shows us the distribution of permafrost um, around the Earth. And I always like to point out where we are. I think I have a pointer, too. Do I? Does it, can I make it work? That's the question. Nope. Um, <laughs> help. Anyway, that we have permafrost in Alberta. And a lot of people don't realize that if you're not into infrastructure and those kinds of things. Um, but there's Canada, over half of our country has permafrost. It's a big piece of, of what makes Canada different than, say, someplace like um, Alabama, along with a whole bunch of other things, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> But permafrost is huge, and it's really important. Um, it's really important in a whole host of ways that I'm going to talk about. But there are definitely people in this room who can talk about permafrost better than me. How do I make this that go away? Like, I, I'm sorry, let I... Really? Anywhere? Did it go away? All right, good. Okay, the other thing that I want to um, remind people of is how the Arctic biosphere is, is special and different than other parts of the biosphere. So we have um, unique wildlife on land, muskox, caribou, and then our smaller creatures like lemmings and Arctic fox and those things. Those are, these are Arctic adapted species. We have polar bears. We have the whole complex marine environment um, all the way down from the benthos where we have um, shellfish and copepods that support the food chain, all the way up to the polar bear and people, and then, of course, all the uh, birds and things like that. So the, this, is a, this is a unique environment in terms of the wildlife and the, um, and the, the plant species that we find. So what's happening in the Arctic? Um, and I thought I would put this all in the context of my time as a person who's been thinking about the Arctic. So really from, let's say, 1992 when I started doing Arctic research to yesterday. Because I think it's important for us to think about how the Arctic has changed within our own lifetimes, within the span of a single generation. So here's what we see with uh, in temperature. In 2016, I gave a version of this talk, and what I said was, exactly, 2016 is a watershed year in the Arctic. The average surface air temperature is the highest it has been since 1900. Record temperature highs occurred in January, February, October, and November, and air temperatures continue to increase at double the global average. This is data from this year. You can see uh, 2017 again, uh, warmer than 2016. In 2015, this graph down here shows the um, global air temperatures and, you know, redder, hotter. The whole northern hemisphere and the Arctic in particular, much hotter than the global average. Um, and here's another graph illustrating the same thing, showing the data from 2018. Again, the Arctic continues to warm at a rate that's faster than anywhere else on Earth. In 2016, I was part of a group of scientists from around the world that ran an exercise about where will we be if we hit two degrees C globally. And we all know, um, 
and if you don't, I'm going to tell you now, that that's a global average, and in the Arctic, we're looking at five to seven degrees Celsius in, in increase in temperature. That is huge, with huge repercussions, not just for the Arctic, but for the planet as a whole. In 2016, when I gave that talk, I also talked about ocean temperature. At that time, sea surface temperatures were anywhere from a half a degree to five degrees above Celsius, above the 1982 to 2010 average. In 2019, so this year, the globally average sea surface temperature was 1.3 degrees uh, Fahrenheit above the 27, uh, the 20th century average. This is the second highest for January and August. Rising ocean temperatures are occurring all over the place, but I'd like you to note that we're seeing particularly hot spots in the Western Arctic, through the Bering Sea, up the coast of Alaska, and those warm waters are moving into the Arctic Ocean. And if you think back to the work that Eddie and Jamie did back in the 1990s, they start, were starting to identify these pulses of warm water that were coming in to the ocean, coming into the north, and we now know that those are, where we now are pretty confident that those are also instrumental in helping to melt ice in the same way that air temperature is. Let's talk about permafrost, although there are, as Brian could probably do this way better than me, but uh, permafrost is the permanently frozen ground. There's an active layer that melts every year in the summer or thaws every year. Permafrost does not melt, it thaws. Um, there's an active layer that thaws every year in the warm season and refreezes again in the winter. As temperatures increase, that active layer is getting deeper. As the active layer gets deeper, it releases uh, organic material begins to decay. That organic material releases carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. That helps to continue to push up uh, atmospheric temperatures, and the whole cycle starts all over again. This table over here, just all you need to know is that everything is going up. That's data from permafrost boreholes from around the Arctic, and consistently we see that from 1980, when this data started to be collected, to 2016, which is the most recent data that I could find, permafrost temperatures, ground temperatures continue to increase. Uh, this is the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where I used to work. Permafrost thawing is not just a problem for the atmosphere and for increased warming. It's actually a huge problem for infrastructure in the north. So that's the parking lot where I used to park my car, where we had a huge uh, melt out of permafrost. Um, this is the Alaska Highway. Um, again, a huge melt out of permafrost. And the other thing that we are now increasingly aware of, largely due to work done by this woman, Katie Walter, is that the permafrost underlying many of the lakes and ponds in the Arctic is thawing. And as that permafrost thaw, it's, it's releasing methane into those lakes. And if you drill a hole in the ice and you light it, you can burn off the methane. And this is happening around the Arctic. And then, of course, there's sea ice. The decline in sea ice has been dramatic. It probably gets the most press, although this year I have to say I've seen everything that I've been talking about here covered in the press. Um, very dramatic declines in sea ice over the years. This year, 20, uh, what's 2019, tied for the second lowest year of melt, uh, biggest melt year on record with 2016 and 2007. 2012 is still the lowest year, but I think it's worth noting that um, the last 13, um, the 13 lowest years on record have occurred in the last 13 years. This is sea ice concentration as of yesterday. So the yellow line you can see on that upper table shows you the average sea ice extent between 1981 and 2010, and that's where we are today. Down here, this, table, this graph is just simply showing you the overall trend in declining sea ice, not just in the summer, but also in the winter. And the red line is 2019, so that's where we are right now. So we're at the bottom of a long-term trend. The other thing I think it's really important to think about with sea ice is not just the fact that we're losing a lot of it in the summer melt, a lot more than we anticipated, but we're actually losing old ice. So Arctic sea ice used to be composed of years, ice that was formed you know, annually every year, as well as what's called old ice, ice that's two years old, three years old, four years old, sometimes older than four years, six, seven years old. This little graphic here shows you the um, age of sea ice uh, back in, I can't even, 
um, a decade or so ago, more than a decade ago, everything that's red is ice that's four years old or older. This is this year. We have virtually got no more multi-year ice left. Well, why does that matter? Well, it matters for a whole bunch of reasons. Single-year ice is thin. It melts faster. It doesn't reflect as much solar energy back to the atmosphere. It allows uh, more solar energy to be absorbed into the ocean, which continues to heat the ocean, which continues to exacerbate the melting out of sea ice. From a biological perspective, I heard a really interesting talk about a year ago from a microbiologist who was looking at the microbiome. What lives in the sea ice? Well, in first-year ice, you have mm, a few species. Um, by the time you get to four and five years, year old ice, you have 15, 20 species. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we losing in the microbiome that might actually be something we would want to not lose? There's all kinds of work being done now on um, pros bioprospecting. What is out there? What, are there? Are there potentially new cures for things? So we've lost that, and it's probably not coming back. Let's talk about land ice, and this is a big one. So we know we are seeing rapid, uh, rapid change in our land ice. At Kluwani Lake, where we have our research station, the glacier has melted out sufficiently so that there's no longer really any freshwater flow into the biggest lake in the Yukon. That's a problem. It's going the other direction. That's a problem for the people who live there. We don't really have a sense of how that's going to change the long-term um, productivity of the fishery, of the land, of the adjacent uh, terrestrial biosphere. Here's the Greenland ice sheet. Um, this is showing us 2018 and 2019. The Greenland ice sheet in 2012 did something that has never been recorded before, and that was there was a period of time where the entire surface of the Greenland ice sheet was melting. Um, not, not for long, but it's the first time that that ever happened. In 2017 and 2018, the average spring snow cover was the lowest it had been since the onset of the satellite record. That's 1967. Um, and the Greenland ice sheet began melting the second earliest time on record. While 2012, so that's the top graph, holds the record for total melt area, 2019, that's this summer, is nearly equal to 2012 because there was so little snow that fell this year. Um, on July 8, 2012, 40% of the ice sheet had undergone thawing at or near the surface, and in just a few days um, had dramatically accelerated. So we estimate from the satellite data that 97% of the ice sheet was thawing by uh, July the 12th. Let's talk about the land. Um, there was a lot of uh, coverage in the papers this summer about fires in the Arctic. We know that the Arctic is both what, what scientists call greening and browning. So we're seeing increased length of the growing season, which means in some places there's more productivity and um, the length of the growing season is obviously longer, and so it's called greening up. So this graph, this figure here, kind of shows you uh, a plant growth change. So everywhere that's getting more and more towards the darker green side are parts of the Arctic where, where we're seeing increased plant growth. Um, but we're also seeing places around the Arctic, and particularly in the uh, subarctic regions, where things are getting drier. And drier is not necessarily good. <laughs> um, we can think about here in Alberta and the dryness associated with the fires that we've had, as well as in British Columbia. But the Arctic is a place that people generally don't think of as being on fire. This is a photograph of a tundra fire in the Noatak National Preserve in Alaska from June 2012. Tundra fires are becoming more and more common over the past two decades as average temperatures in the Arctic rise and sea ice is receding. According to scientists, many of whom I have worked with over the years, there's a marked increase in lightning activity, particularly in Alaska. Um, and winter temperatures, because they are also warmer, seem to be contributing to the ability of vegetation to grow, which in turn makes it more of a risk when, a light, when there is a lightning strike. Normally, in this part of Alaska that, that uh, you're seeing up here on the right-hand side, um, which is near the Anaktuvik River, so close to, the Arctic, close to the Arctic Ocean, normally this tundra in this area takes up more carbon dioxide from photosynthesis than it gives off every year from natural decomposition. 
overall, the amount of carbon released just from that one um, carbon fire was, that one fire is about 2.1 teragrams, which is comparable to what comes from forest fires in, in other parts, on other parts of the earth. Um, and this is kind of surprising to us because if you think about a big forest fire in British Columbia, we're talking huge trees, lots of carbon stored in those trees, lots going into the atmosphere. In the tundra, we're talking, even with increase in greening, small plants like this. So where is all that carbon coming from? It's coming from the soil itself. So it's not just the trees burning, but it's the actual, it's the actual ground. Um, so an additional problem, too, is that as that you have these fires in the tundra, the burn leaves behind a, a thinner layer of soil. To, that means there's less protection for the permafrost, which means we're accelerating, again, permafrost thaw. So all of that combustion has all kinds of consequences, not just the CO2 um, itself. This summer, we know that it was an unprecedented year for fires in the Arctic. This is from the summer. This is a the satellite photo from a satellite image from August 1. Every one of those red spots is a tundra fire or a, a fire in the Arctic regions. Russia, in particular, was, was hammered, but there were also uh, large out of control fires in Greenland. This is a photograph of a Russian uh, Arctic community, which is pretty much what it was like in that community and many communities across the Russian Arctic for months this year. Um, we know that the amount of CO2 emitted from the fires in the Arctic this summer is equivalent to what the country of Sweden puts out in a single year. Uh, wildlife. So it's not good. <laughs> um, we know in the ocean that ocean acidification is expanding from the shelves into the deeper Arctic basin, which has particularly um, worrying consequences for the long-term sustainability of the smaller organisms that have uh, shells that are uh, prone to decalcification and that are really sitting at the bottom of the food web, that feed the polar cod, that feed the ring seals, that feed the people. Um, Permafrost, um, I've already talked about, but the changes to the ocean and the changes to the land are leading to the uh, shifting in the distribution of terrestrial species around the north. Uh, musk oxen and most caribou herds are in serious decline. And it's not just climate-related decline, but it's also pollution-related decline. The Arctic is now turning out to be a place where plastics from around the world, and particularly microplastics, are congregating. And those are in getting in the food chain. And they're also exacerbating the speed at which the sea ice melts, because they are dark, they're embedded in the sea ice, they speed up the melt. You know this, if you have a fireplace and you throw your ashes out on the snow, that part of the snow melts before the rest of the snow in your yard. Um, so here's what we see going on with caribou populations. Every single one has declined um, from 2014 to today. Um, beluga whales are facing a whole host of, of issues. Um, we've had, I, I wrote a grant proposal this summer and it was about biodiversity in the Arctic and conservation and I thought I'll just look for an example to, um, to talk about why we should be looking at new and innovative ways for maintaining biodiversity in the Arctic and in the space of a single week I found a report of a multi-species die-off in Norton Sound, Alaska that is attributed directly to increased water temperatures in the Bering Sea. Uh, the Bering Strait, excuse me, a uh, huge uh, stranding of whales in Iceland, 50 plus whales in Iceland, and a big paper out of the University of Manitoba talking about the fact that beluga whales are getting smaller and thinner and looking like they're gonna have some serious problems reproducing and maintaining a healthy population, and that is directly linked to the decline in the nutritional quality of the food that, be that the belugas are consuming in the Western Arctic. So what are the big questions? Um, now that everybody wants to just probably go straight to the bar, um, what are the big questions that we're facing? We know these things are happening, and I have to say, like, I have only scratched the surface 
of the changes that we're seeing. I haven't talked about economics. I haven't talked about politics. I haven't talked about social issues. I've really just focused here today on some of the big um, physical and biological changes. But all of those other things are part and parcel of what we're seeing happen in the Arctic. So what are the big changes? What are the big questions we should be thinking about as we move forward? You know, today even, or tomorrow, or this afternoon. I think it's something we should be thinking about, not just in this room, but as a country. This is a huge part of our country. And I, I, my personal feeling is we have a responsibility to make sure that we sustain it for the better, not just betterment of the people who live there, but for our nation as a whole. And really, in, in some sense, it is a planetary responsibility. What is the Arctic going to look like if we hit two degrees C? What, we know where we are now, and we're not at two degrees C yet. How is that going to impact the global community? How directly does what's happening in the Arctic influence lower latitudes? Um, we know more and more every day about that, whether it's the influence on weather, precipitation, on decision making, on politics. Um, can we reverse Arctic change? There's some really interesting work being done now, uh, people thinking about, well, can we regrow sea ice? What do we have to do to regrow sea ice? Um, should, we do, should we try and regrow sea ice? And then um, I think really importantly, and this is a discussion we've started to have in this country, certainly in the last 10 years, um, what are Inuit and indigenous priorities? What are their research priorities and how can we work in cooperation and collaboration with Arctic people to make sure their priorities are addressed. Well, here are some of the impacts we already know. We know that regional scale marine and terrestrial uh, ecosystems are being impacted. We know that we're seeing inundation of coastal and nearshore regions. This is the flood in New Talk, Alaska. Just to give you some perspective on this, New Talk is about 15 miles from the coast. This is a flood due to storm surge in a region that normally at this time of year would have been protected by uh, shore fast ice, but isn't. And so, you know, the entire storm surge up the New Talk River through the community, uh, devastating people's, people's homes and um, the infrastructure and their, boat, their stuff. That's expensive. Alaska is looking at relocating something like 20 communities from coastal zones that are uh, impacted already by flooding. The study to just look at a, the relocation of one single community is already in excess of $60 million, and that community hasn't even moved yet. So let's just multiply that for the state of Alaska. Let's multiply that for other places around the world. Um, and then, of course, this whole question about relocation has social um, and economic impact. What about the community ties, the, the ties to the land, the ties to their homeland? Um, what are um, some of the unanticipated impacts of these changes that we're seeing? So one of the things that people have been talking a lot about recently is rain on snow. As the Arctic gets warmer in the winter, we're starting to see um, what normally might have been a snowstorm turn into a rainstorm. This is hugely problematic for Arctic wildlife species. Um, in the rain falls on the snow, it forms a thick layer of ice, animals can't get through the ice to forage, they starve. Uh, this is a mass starvation event in uh, Arctic Scandinavia. Um, we've had many of them. In Canada, we had one on Banks Island in, uh, about a decade ago that decimated, Mus I think it was longer than that, the muskox population. So does it really matter if a whole population of muskox disappears from the Western Arctic? Well, I would argue that it does, and it argues for a whole bunch of reasons, not just the social and cultural ones, but the economic ones, the ecosystem ones, and those things transcend just the Western Canadian Arctic. So um, I, I'm glad my friend Susan Coots isn't here to correct me on probably a mess some of this up, but here's the muskox, right? They depend on the vegetation that's in the Arctic for nu 
nutrition. But they are prone, and we are seeing increasingly that they're susceptible to climate-related disease and extreme events like rain on snow. Muskox are important culturally as a source of food for people in the Western Arctic, but they are also an important. They also were an important source of um, money, economic economic prosperity. There was subsistence hunting. There were, you know, outfitters that supported sport hunting. People came from around the world. There are tourism. People come to see the muskox. Muskox also for a while were part of a commercial hunt and um, Andrew Applejohn is here from NWT. He could probably speak to that better than I can. But the commercial hunt was shut down. Well, I think what a lot of people don't know is that some of the product of the commercial muskox hunt not went to just feed people in the Arctic, but actually muskox hide and muskox hair went around the world. It went to places like Peru where it was processed and turned into usable wool and came back. And if you've ever been to Banff, there's a shop in Banff that sells very expensive luxury products made from muskox. So this little Western Arctic muskox herd was part of a whole global economic system as well as supporting a small um, number of people in the Western Arctic in a whole variety of different ways. Um, let's just talk about sea level rise quickly. So I think it's important to think about sea level rise, not just with respect to how it's going to impact, say, Arctic communities in Alaska or in the Western Canadian Arctic or maybe even people in Nova, Nova Scotia, but think about it as a, this is a global issue. Um, this year the Greenland ice sheet, this is Greenland ice loss um, from 92 to 2001. 34 gigatons, 2002 to 2011. So the next de decade, 215 gigatons. Um, this is just showing us the global sea level rise um, from 1995 with a projection out to 220 that includes the contribution from the Greenland ice sheet as well as thermal expansion. So when water gets warmer, it expands. That also contributes to global sea level rise. 40% of the United States lives in a coastal area that is vulnerable to sea level rise. And even a small rise of 14 centimeters has a huge impact on coastal communities. Um, this is why the small island nations of the South Pacific have been so vocal about the need to do something about climate change because they're going to disappear. Those countries will be gone. And if we want to think about the planet as a whole, look at Asian cities. Um, this, is, this is a graph. I'm sorry it doesn't show up that well. But over on the left, it's how many people will be affected in Oceania and Africa? How many people will be affected in Europe? How many people will be affected in North America, South America, and there's Asia? Millions and millions and millions and millions of people. And this is already um, on our doorstep. So clearly, there's a lot of challenges we face. We know there are a lot of risks. So what are the opportunities? Um, I think there are opportunities. I, I, I want to sort of wrap up by talking about not the doom and gloom, because it's there, and we need to think about it. We need to do something about it. But I also want to talk about how we've progressed in our thinking about the Arctic and the kind of research that we do there and the way we do it. We've come a really long way since um, 1998 um, in understanding how the physical and the biological components of the Arctic function, and a long way, I would, I would suggest, in our appreciation of the diversity of Arctic societies and cultures and indigenous languages and indigenous expertise and knowledge. The way that we now frame and conduct research in the Arctic has changed dramatically over the last 30 years. Not enough, but still dramatically. We've seen a fundamental shift in our approach to how we observe and understand what's happening in the Arctic. We, as a, as a research community, and our, understand that there are, there are huge um, challenges for us. Um, and I, I want to talk about how environmental change research has, has shifted. Uh, 25 years ago, when I first started working in the Arctic, oh, um, <laughs> We really, um, I would say most environmental scientists ignored Arctic people. We knew they were there, but we kind of modeled it as a passive recipients of change, like something happening here, I'll adapt to it, but I, I'm not really, you know, we didn't, we didn't think about them as um, integral to the system. We didn't think about the ways that they could contribute to understanding what was happening in the North. 
Sure, we recognized that people had developed um, sophisticated technologies, that they'd been adapting to change in the North for thousands of years, but that's kind of where we, where we ended it. Um, and this is what I would call like an impacts perspective. What's the impact? What's the impact? Rather than um, a more um, what's the, what do people need? What do people want? What do people know kind of perspective, which isn't really perspective, but it's kind of a framework. Um, and if you go back and you look at science plans and you look at government documents and you look at all of the things that people were saying about what was happening in the Arctic 25 years ago, that's really the overlying kind of framework in which it all sits. But I would say that in the 1990s, this began to change. And I think we can trace that change in how we think and do work in the Arctic to a whole convergence of events. Oops, I went too far. Um, and I would start by saying those um, come first from the science, so some of the things that started to come out from the work that the Arctic oceanographers are doing. Second of all, from the opening, I'm gonna talk about the science first, from the opening of the Russian Arctic and the influx of scientific information that started to come out of the Russian Arctic and the influx of scientists from other parts of the world into the uh, Russian Arctic. Um, and third, I would argue that it is the indigenous people of the Arctic who pushed and pushed and pushed for their land claim settlement, for their formation of things like the Inuit Circumpolar Council, for the creation of the territory of Nunavut. That changed the whole discussion around many things, and one of those things was how science is done, what kind of science is done, and who it's being done for, and who, why we should be doing it in partnership. I'm done, I'm just about done. Um, and so this is the context that we find ourselves in today. We've moved forward in many er areas with respect to our understanding of what is going on, of how the system works, of where it's likely to go in the future. Particularly, I think we've moved forward, at least some of us, I hope that I'm one of them, have moved forward in how we think about doing research in partnership with the people who live in the Arctic. Um, and a better, um, the question is now, we know we face these challenges. We know that indigenous people have particular priorities. We know that as a nation we have particular priorities. What are we going to do about it? Um, are we gonna keep doing the same science that we do, only pushing it slower forward more incrementally? Or are we gonna do something a little differently? People, and young people in particular, I think, are calling for action and they're calling for solutions. And I don't think, I know it, there are millions of young people out in the streets. We should be paying attention to them. Um, scientists, indigenous knowledge holders, indigenous experts um, are now working together, but I think we need to broaden those partnerships. We need to have non-traditional partnerships with government, with the private sector, to address some of the problems that are stemming from the situation that we find ourselves in, both in the Arctic and on a global scale. And so, I believe that there are solutions to these problems. I believe there is a pathway forward, but I also believe strongly and more and more every day that this has to be a collective activity. And so, having said that, I'm gonna turn the rest of this day over to people who really know something, to people who are working on these problems every day, whether it's from a biomedical perspective, whether it's thinking about glaciers, whether it's trying to implement strategies and policies that will benefit northerners and by extension all Canadians. I would say in closing that I think we're all in this together and I'm confident we can get to where we want to be, which is a better future for everybody. So I am done. Mm -hmm.